Before we dive into the look back with CBS News, I'd like to cover a few points which were missed in my raw, quote unquote, no note style, deep psych dive on abandonment and possible mental illnesses. I'd like to just add, just to really strengthen the point of abandonment being a huge part in these crimes and the escalation over the years of the crimes to the murder spree, I will mention that the highest form of abandonment that David Berkowitz felt was the abandonment and rejection by God. He's written in some of his letters that he hated God. And he's also written that even when he was involved very heavily in the Baptist church at Fort Knox, that he would laugh in his mind like he would say things and he knew they weren't true or he didn't believe them to be true. But David had a deep resentment and hatred towards God. And this is due to his feelings of abandonment. He was unwanted. He was rejected by his biological parents. God took Pearl from him. So I thought I'd throw that in. I will include it in the next psych dive. And let's just sit back, get a drink, get a snack, whatever you need, get yourself cozy, comfy, and let's enjoy the movie. I will be in chat with you, so let's discuss, let's have some good dialogue. And thank you all for being here. It was the 1970s, and a serial killer walked the streets of New York City for more than a year, terrorizing everyone, especially women, until this man was captured, putting an end to it all, but leaving many with the question, why? Hello, I'm Maurice Dubois. Thanks for joining us for this look back at the son of Sam. David Berkowitz's reign of terror spanned 13 months. He used a 44 caliber handgun to shoot innocent people in three of the city's five boroughs in more than a dozen seemingly random attacks. The crimes led to one of the biggest manhunts in the city's history. Let's go back to the beginning. On July 29th, 1976, Berkowitz attacked his first victims in the Bronx when he shot two 18-year-old women, Jody Valenti and Donna Loria. They were sitting in Valenti's car when they were shot, and Loria did not survive. On October 23rd and November 27th in Queens, four more people were shot. They all survived. Two months later, in January of 77, he struck again. 26-year-old Christine Frund and her fiancé, John Deal, were shot as they sat in Deal's car in Flushing. He survived. Frund, who was hit twice, later died. Berkowitz waited another two months before showing up in Flushing again to kill 19-year-old college student Virginia Voskarishian as she walked home. On April 17, 1977, 18-year-old Valentina Suriani and her boyfriend, 20-year-old Alexander Esau, were sitting in Suriani's car near her home in the Bronx when they were each shot twice and died. For the first time, the 44 caliber killer, as he was known, left a handwritten note for the police at the crime scene. It is there that he referred to himself as Son of Sam and promised to commit more killings. David Berkowitz's killing spree ended almost exactly one year after it began on July 31st, 1977. That is when 20-year-old Robert Violante and 18-year-old Stacy Moskowitz were shot in Violante's car in Brooklyn. Violante would lose his left eye. Moskowitz would die 18 hours after the attack. The shootings were the first to take place in the borough of Brooklyn and the first involving a victim with blonde hair. Reed Collins of CBS News had this report. At 5.22 p.m. Monday, Stacy Moskowitz stopped living. The doctors said they had not turned off the life support. It was just that the horrible damage done by a 44 caliber bullet in the brain was too much. 40 minutes after their daughter died, the parents spoke to reporters. Even though I lost so dear, 
I found many friends who I'll never forget. And I thank you for being kind and for your sympathies. I hope he suffers for the rest of his life. I hope he never has a minute's peace. I hope he suffers and, and just eats his heart out with a cancer because he's nothing, he's not human. He's not human. To do this to a young girl and a young boy, if I was the child, that woman has a son that's blind. To do this to young people, he can't be normal. He's not normal. And I would give anything. I would give my life right here and now. My daughter is dead, but I would die right here and now to see this man punished. Well, the city is preoccupied with the killer who in one note signed himself the son of Sam. The latest victims were shot in Brooklyn, a new area for the assailant. An element of fear pervades neighborhoods which have not known fear before. And it's something that we all have to worry about. What is your wife saying? She wouldn't even come out tonight. You know, she cried tonight when she heard that the girl died. Stacy Morris died. And, uh, you know, I said that I was going to take her right out and see what the feeling was out here, and she didn't want to come. She doesn't want to leave the house until he's caught. She wants to stay home because she's frightened. A beefed-up task force of 300 is working on the case now, sifting for clues, manning telephones, answering a flood of 8,000 calls in just one day. The one common element to the shootings is a gun, a five-shot, 44 caliber revolver made by Charter Arms, one of some 28,000 manufactured. Bullets in all the attacks have come from the same weapon. Whoever holds that weapon has killed six people and wounded seven in one year and three days. The police have a composite sketch of their suspect compiled from witnesses' descriptions. But no one in the city of 8 million knows who is next. Reed Collins, CBS News, New York. Up next, his killing spree comes to an end. How police finally caught up to the son of Sam and what happened after his arrest. Plus an outburst in court from Berkowitz and a victim. Stay with us. In all, David Berkowitz killed six people and injured seven others. On August 10th, 1977, police finally caught him, arresting him in front of his apartment building in Yonkers 45 years ago this month. Here's a look back at his capture and outburst during his first court appearance. About four hours after David Berkowitz was brought to police headquarters in Manhattan, police said ballistics tests conclusively proved that the 44 caliber bulldog revolver found in his car was the weapon used to kill the son of Sam's last victim, Stacy Moskowitz. Police artists had drawn several composites of what they thought son of Sam looked like. It turned out that he most closely resembled the first sketch. There was a key witness. Police refused to identify her, a woman who says she saw police officers ticket Berkowitz's car the night of the last murder after hearing shots and being approached by a man with a dark object in his hand. The woman was afraid she might be stalked by Son of Sam and waited four days before contacting police. Berkowitz lived in Yonkers, north of New York. Police searching his apartment found one or more notes in the same handwriting as earlier Son of Sam messages. Police described him as a loner. <laughs> he doesn't know anything beyond. Remember, he's using the dime in the, in the pay phone back yeah. in 1977. I remember you were like, is that him? That's him. There he is. No, right. that's him. Right. I remember but I, I flinched when I saw yeah. him. I, w I, was, I was afraid. But then as, I, as it warmed up, mm. here's this guy who's become a Christian mm. who says he, it wasn't him. It wasn't, he wasn't in his right mind when he right. did this. He said there were voices talking to him. I mean, it was a wholly unsatisfying explanation. Mm. You know, I was part of a cult, he said. Mm. The cops are convinced he acted alone. Yes, yes. He claims yes. these other things. What do you, where do you think the truth lies? I think, I think in his interview, he was, he, was, he was more saying that there were like demons with him as right. opposed to other people working with him. Voices. That, yeah, when he was acting out, you know, there were other, there, the devil was with him or, or there were demon-esque things that were possessing him. He wasn't just himself. I don't think he was really saying that he was part of like a cult where there were more accomplices. Okay. You know, and actually the, uh, the chief of detectives who we interviewed for right. that, you know, he said once we arrested him and they checked out all the cult stuff, the shootings and homicides stopped. You know, so they were, the police were obviously convinced that he was uh, acting alone. That was their proof. Yeah. Really chilling was the idea that he was getting ready to kill again <clears throat> outside the five boroughs. He was yeah. looking at the Hamptons as yeah. his next stop. What yeah, do you remember go, about He was going to go to a very popular discotheque out in Southampton area. 
And he had, he had automatic weapons in his trunk. He was ready to do more than just solo shooting of one or two people in a lover's lane. He's going to step he, it up. Yeah. The kind of stuff we see today, actually, on, on a grander scale. Right. Yeah. Do you think there are more victims? He pleaded guilty to six killings, seven shooting injuries. I'd have to say no. I, I think, you know, he was using a very unique gun, high caliber 44 bullet. Um, that's how they eventually put the case together against him, that they had separate two, three, four shootings. And there was the police department finally recognized, whoa, we're getting somebody shot here with a high caliber gun, high caliber bullet here. And that's when they began to see the pattern. It wasn't just separate shooting in the Bronx and a shooting in Queens. And we don't know, you know, what the, they connected it through the bullets. So I, I would think that that's it, or they would have found more. Yeah. I think they would have found more. So but those, those were terrifying enough. Tell, tell yeah, me about six it. Six dead, seven wounded. No question. You know, over an extended period. And he's come up for parole, I believe, correct? Do I have that right? Um, a number of times, but it doesn't look like he's going to get out of prison. Do you think he'll ever see the light of day again? He's led an exemplary uh, life inside prison, but I think there would always be the, the question of, uh, is he a danger to society? And I don't think the state of New York would want to risk that, actually, or the people on the parole board. That's my opinion. Yeah, I don't think anybody would want to risk that. No, <laughs> no, be honest I, with you. Yeah, I agree. Any other thoughts on this 45th anniversary, Murray? You know, it's funny. It's one of the things that hit me today. It's not a it's not per se this case, but you know, you think how terrifying that case was and how he got away with it for so long. You know, there was no surveillance cameras in those days. So the the, the difficulty of that case, you know, is 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 what's striking. You know, that a, a man could walk around with a weapon and 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 kill people and literally um, you know, how, how do you begin to solve a case like that? And and so the you the, the, the police were at an enormous disadvantage, obviously. And that, you know, that's some of the singular differences between then and now. Right. And the parking ticket that broke this case open, that's, that's unbelievable. That's a remarkable story right. that, uh, and I recall uh, being told that when they, when they were told by a witness that, oh, I saw some car get tagged with a parking ticket, and they went looking for it, the police couldn't find it. And the cop on the beat kind of didn't even remember that he gave a ticket and they had to go scouring through closets and lockers to find, to actually find that summons that led to the name Berkowitz. And they thought maybe he was just another witness. Right. And so, you know, he came out and the cops were there. No, they called the precinct, right. the local precinct up there. And the woman who answered the phone was the daughter of uh, Sam Carr, whose dog he had shot. And she said, oh, that, that guy's crazy. And the next thing you know, the cops are up there and he comes out. You and got me. Boom. Yeah, you got me. Yeah. Amazing detail. Murray Weiss, thank you so much. Certain media coverage of the killings drew criticism at the time, especially from some competing papers that felt the murders were being exploited and Berkowitz was being glorified. Eye on Two was a talk show here on CBS2. There was a panel of guests, including Daily News columnist Jimmy Breslin, who sat down together in October of that year. And you can see that part of our special as well as anything you missed here on CBSNewYork.com. I'm Maurice Dubois. This has been a look back at the Son of Sam. Thanks for joining us. Son of Sam was a big story for everybody, but it was even bigger for Jimmy Breslin. That's because the killer chose Breslin as his conduit to a larger public. Soon, both of them had made it to a chosen spot, the front page. Alexander Coburn of the Village Voice is one media critic who has questioned Jimmy Breslin's Son of Sam coverage, especially Breslin's use of a letter apparently sent him by David Berkowitz. You said in one of your columns, you said when discussing this matter, whether you should have published the... Uh the letter, you talked about the danger of self-censorship, and I think the history of this sees that it's not a matter of self-censorship, it's a matter of seeing what you're actually doing in journalism in creating what I thought was one of the most disgusting episodes I've seen in journalism, which is pandering to this uh, whole um, the series of murders over the summer and into the fall. Do you, I mean, you're, you're suggesting that murder isn't a big story? Is it, is it, I mean, is that your opinion? I, I think mean, murder, as the story that came in the papers, it was uh, blown ludicrously out of proportion, and it, with very unhealthy social results. What were the unhealthy social results? Well, I think the, the present mayor elect, uh, Mr. Koch, um, advocating capital punishment in certain Ed cases. Ed Koch has been advocating capital punishment for some time, and he didn't. Yeah, but why do you think it took off in that particular case? Well, Abe Beam, you yourself no. noted that no. Abe Beam, Beam did Abe, try Abe to Beam, ride this story. Abe a Beam bit. started it by coming in, started the, the, the political aspect of it by coming in. But at this time, you know, uh, you've got to 
remember here, this man had killed five people before anyone took any notice of the fact that the murders were connected, before, in fact, ballistics was able to put the thing together. That's one, two. There have been, uh, if there's one thing I learned out of this, it's that we covered this as I would cover it again. I mean, I don't care if it's a murder. I, that goes through the ages. That's, Shakespeare wrote about them. How many times have there been lunatics loose in the black community and they've killed just as Berkowitz did, six and seven, and we took no note of it at all? And then that's the thing I learned out of this to start watching up there. They, in, 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 in neighborhoods where the poor stick, people live, this was common. I thing. agree, and I think that's a, a very valid point. Mm. But to stick to this case mm. in point, mm. uh, what about the predictive aspects of, let's say, the column on Death Day, on the anniversary of the yeah. shooting of the first yeah. victim? Yeah after Bobby Violante and Stacey Moskowitz were killed 36 hours after death day, did, it, did you ever have a moment saying, geez, did I cause this? Did this column trigger this nut? No. Never and in, and in reading the And in reading the uh, psychiatric report on Berkowitz, it just would be, when it's released finally, it'll just reinforce that too. I mean, he just was going out 30 nights a month looking for someone to kill. And he would, he would look at a face that's every night of the week. And yet the news media and the mayor combined to make uh -huh. that night, the night of the 29th of July, into a kind of special night. And this, as you say, from a killer who previously hadn't shown any chronological pattern. Is that like well, taunting the guy into action? No, I don't think it was taunting. I mean, this man had been, uh, just been going out looking to kill at all times. And it, it, where did it begin? It started with him writing about it, the 29th. He was the one that brought up the date. He was the one that impressed the police and that most of the psychiatrists seemed to think that that was a date that was, uh, that was an important you date. You mentioned the police, and Alec, you had mentioned the police in the column, that, that this is the kind of story in which reporters have to work with the police in ways that I know you find very troubling, Alex. You, yeah, you mentioned that, that... One thing on the 20 that, that, no, no, gonna... I think on this police thing, I think it came to the fact that uh, uh, Breslin and other people, it, there was a symbiosis with the police. I think. Uh, very often, I think, in explaining why that original letter was published in the news, which I have a lot of problems with, it's the police... Uh, you have problems with publishing that letter? Then no, no. obviously you're not in the news business. Well, it's like saying, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a prostitute. What do you want me to say? Well, I mean, I, well, I, 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 you've already said you're not in the news business. That, we, that we've just if determined. No problems, if you have no problems with ever publishing that letter, no, that you I'm may in the have stimulated... Yeah, quite quite obviously that. you're not. No, in. you said you have no problems no, thinking back that that might have stimulated the guy to do it. If you've never even thought of that... Oh, well, then you really... That's absolutely you really, that uh, your columns uh, there, you never even considered that that might have prompted him to do a killing that particular I mean, you're time. Really, you're not in the news the, business. That was a lot of the news business. You're the news about we're the saying letter. the end of the news business, the result of the news well, business is yeah. the headlines around this studio. No, no, the, it's new, the headlines news business. Is my, my business this is, is psychotic reaction this. to this. Well, thing. then what should we do? Not write? I think you read a good deal oh, too much about right? it. Yeah, I certainly do. And no. I think the Post uh, became a newspaper war and people It seems to me you still write about it in order to keep the name alive. You're still oh, writing it. about it weeks after everyone has. Why does your preoccupation I've written about two, because two you, know, about you know the people read I'm it the minute they read the name. Come the on, stop playing games with me. No, there's no games there playing. Was a letter, Look at these headlines around. Do you think that there was no, no exaggeration of this come case on. at all? Work a little bit in the business, then come back and talk. You you want to know about publishing that letter? You think that the, is there some question that that letter shouldn't have been published? Is, is, is that the problem here? A yeah. letter from Berkowitz to Breslin shouldn't have been published. Well, I'm not sure that I'm ready to say that. I am ready to, to ask, though, mm -hmm. once the police start saying, publish this and don't publish oh, well, that. Here's, here's exactly don't tell them about the, I'll tell you exactly the, the fingerprint. For the example. fingerprint we held out. Right. No question about it. That there was a fingerprint on mm -hmm. the letter we held out. No question. Here's exactly how that, that letter came to the office on a day I wasn't there, and it was read by uh, um, Anne-Marie Caggiano, works in there. And Pete Hamill. And they called me up and said, this is a lunatic wrote this time. Uh, you better come in and look at it. So I said, send it to the police. To let them look at it. I'm, I'm home. I was working. And the police called back and said, could we meet you at the 109th Precinct? This is a letter from the fellow. And they gave me the letter and said, no, we've got a whole, we, they gave me a copy. They had the original letter had to be held as evidence, right? Fine. They said, now, I, what do you think you could do with it to help us? That wasn't there. They were not running. And so I said, uh, well, let's talk. We spoke for an hour, hour and a half. And we weren't there. Nobody was, had anything particular ideas. And I said, I know one uh, psychiatrist that I always speak to in this did city. You, did you do anything else on police request other than not mention the fingerprint? Never. Not a thing. Yes, I kept addresses out of, uh, of two people.
I just do you worry about in. this as a continuing relationship? In other words, does this give the police department a hold on Breslin? We helped you on this, you uh, helped me, us on that, whatever. Me, they, it, it was, uh, you know, that we were talking was, was very great. I mean, my position on the police had been, they just don't put enough men on the street. And they don't work long enough hours. I mean, I've been writing that for all my life. 25 hour a week is long for a policeman. Jimmy, frankly, so, yeah. As writing this story, this became a kind of newspaper war. Was there ever a time when you heard the Post footsteps, when you got a sense of we've got to have a bigger story, oh, bigger black no. print? Oh, come on, that's there? absurd. Is it absolutely absurd? Absolutely not, yes. For me, it is. It, it isn't for me. I'm very for curious me. what well, channels just, 4, 7, 9, 11, well, I'm 68 not, are doing. I, I really am not. You say you're in the news business, but you think not. what the opposition is doing. I just think what Jimmy Breslin does, and that's it. And I really don't, I, I, can't, be, I can't be responsible for anyone else. So that second time do, the letter went on the front page, the letter after, after the that they was arrested? That they wrote that me a letter in man. What, what, did well, that, what good did that do? I don't know. I, I ran, a letter came. I thought it was of interest to readers, and it ran. There seems to be some interest out in the streets to do with this case. And we Is that a that healthy interest? interest well, that's, that's just a you think? Is that a healthy Come interest on, murder? Yeah. Or, or in this particular kind Gee, of... Gee, uh, Shakespeare had no trouble uh -huh. finding it healthy. Did he? Murder? Huh? Through, through all the ages. The New Yorkers seemed to have some trouble with it, and yet they were the first ones to run in cold blood by Truman Capote. I mean, they uh, devoted an issue to it. I th they never had any problem with murder either. Uh, it just, in the, in, in the ang anxiousness to get into the topic, which was a consuming topic, uh, pe uh, people like the New Yorker, Mr. Coburn, would, would write critical articles about the people involved in it thereby putting themselves into it and giving themselves a chance to write about it. Saying that the news coverage Gentlemen, we have it. done the television's favorite trick. We've run out of time. While Jimmy Breslin was wrestling with being son of Sam's conduit and his conscience, a rival cross town was mad to become his chronicler. The New York Post got son of Sam into the paper just about any way it could. As Simon Galvin, who worked with New York Post publisher Rupert Murdoch in Australia, put it, it was really quite a break. This is the kind of story that Rupert does best. He's always been lucky that way. The point man of the Murdoch platoon, reporter Steve Dunleavy, and we'll talk with him next. Son of Sam may have been Rupert Murdoch's meat, but the Post was still second at the table to Breslin and the Daily News. And a lot of critics have said that Post reporter Steve Dunleavy went to inexcusable lengths to catch up. One example, an ill-founded scare story like the one of July 29th, the anniversary of the first killing of Donna Loria. Gunman Sparks, Son of Sam Chase, reads the headline, but of course by the time the headline ran, Steve, you, the Post, and the police all knew that nobody was chasing Son of Sam that night. What's going on? Isn't that really just appealing to fear that's loose in the neighborhood? Well, I think what's going on is you should do your homework. Um, in actual fact, the police did say it was a Son of Sam Chase. They employed the, um, the 109. Uh, and at one stage, they uh, even they thought. Uh, How even long did thought, that story up until hold? 10 uh, up until 10 o'clock that morning, as a matter of fact. So I think before you say things like that, I think you should check. First of all, you said about we were second uh, to the Daily News. Well, I think the very fact that Berkowitz wrote first to Jimmy, I mean, Jimmy's an actor, isn't he? You know, he really, you know, I'm a street reporter. And Berkowitz, being the nut that he was, uh, wrote to uh, the biggest profile. And Jimmy's an actor, you see. so. They wrote to the actor. Um, they didn't write to the editor of the uh, New York Post or to the uh, or to the uh, publisher. Or to and Steve yet, Dunleavy. soon within days, wasn't the Post? Wasn't Steve Dunleavy soliciting letters from David Berkowitz? Wasn't there a please open communications with us? See, once again, you're not doing your homework. If you read the pa if you read the piece, and I'm sure it's here somewhere, you'd have said, please give yourself up, give yourself up to the police. If not, call us. Now, another point of this is that the police... Actually, I believe the sentence is, call us, and if not, call the New York police. Well, that was, I think, the Post perspective on this almost throughout. Well, I, no, not at all. That's absolute rubbish. Um, the point is that the police, um, how many thousand strong they are, uh, there's more police than there are reporters. But uh, as the police quite obviously saw, we had, a, we had a much better conduit. And we're talking about a city that was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. It certainly was. I mean, to say, when you get well, people look, cutting look. their hair, when you get people dying their hair, when you get people, when you get my wife who was scared to even walk the street, when you get me who was scared to walk the street, for God's sake, you know, we knew what was going down. Arya Nair is with us, and Arya, Arya is with the American Civil Liberties Union. 
Truthfully, what Steve is talking about sounds to me like self-induced hysteria. I'm wondering whether there wasn't a kind of socially induced hysteria. Well, uh, I guess what bothers me most is that uh, Mr. Dunleavy just now uh, cited the police in order to, um, to justify his stories. Uh, I was bothered all along that uh, the papers uh, not only induced the hysteria, not only made Son of Sam a great celebrity, and I object to that, uh, but they also crawled into bed with the police. Uh, they suspended all critical judgment of the police. Uh, he tells us now that he ran that story about uh, the gunman, uh, and the police uh, were still telling him that uh, that was the gunman or that was Son of Sam they thought they were chasing. I don't know if he ever did a story criticizing them afterwards for uh, misleading him, misleading the city of New York. I don't recall any stories in the Post or um, almost any other paper criticizing know, the police. Look, I don't know what the civil liberties are doing in on this, in this conversation in the first place. Well, I don't like um, the press and the police in bed together. That's one thing. The police and the press in bed together? For God's sake, we're trying to, we were trying to catch a killer. Do you think that you think well, that we're going to do that? No, what is, is, so, I'm sorry, you said... I said, is that the press's job, to try and beat the police to a killer? What's we, going went on. To, we went in bed with the police. I, very, rarely, very rarely do I agree with Breslin, but I think what he said was right. I mean, uh, they said, uh, and they, they told him, you know, don't let's print this uh, letter right now. And, uh, uh, and when they did tell him, uh, I thought uh, that they, they certainly thought that they were going to bring him out. As a matter of fact, I even remember... Someone from the Chicago Tribune, I remember the cop said, look, maybe a woman would bring him out. A woman's uh, story would bring him out. We weren't worried about laying in bed with the police. What, do you think we were taking, you know, do you think we were taking bribes or something from him? Or that we were giving them well, bribes? One of, one I don't of think so. That's a fallacious argument. I don't know what well, you're doing here. All you're, all you're saying you, is that you were a lousy bribe, policeman, fact, that you were trying to play space policeman. and glory, and weren't you, in fact, in some sense, well, trading <laughs> space and glory on this story with the police? No reporter does that unless, I mean, you're a reporter. Do you indulge in glory? I'll throw the question back at you. I think that some glory is inescapable, but it seems to me that in this story, glory or, or space became the quarry. Well, I don't know. If you can't escape glory, I, I certainly can, you know. As I said, I'm just an average, average street reporter who does as I'm told. One of the, the city editor appoints me, I go. That's about all there is to it. One of the consequences of the way the press worked with the police is after they caught somebody, the police told the press all kinds of things the police had no business telling the press. They told the press that they got all kinds of information from Berkowitz, which only the killer could have known. The police violated every guideline of their right, own. They violated every court rule. Is there something when a newsman should the worry about? Let me, take you, let me take you up on it. Now, you tell me exactly what was said and what cops said it. Okay, I can recall no, you reading in the exactly. papers. I can recall reading in the papers detailed interviews between the police and um, David Berkowitz. Uh, you've, and got a, you've got a virulent imagination, I can tell you, because well, as a matter of fact, the cops, the cops, um, uh, ask anybody John in Keenan the city of New York, they'll remember that one. Looking yeah. over my shoulder in the New York Post, Carl Pellick story, one of the lead paragraphs, Detective William Sullivan, one of those who questioned Berkowitz, said, quote, he shows no remorse. Well, what, uh, is, what indeed when, does that mean? I mean, apart from the fact that, that what else would it, what, what else would a, a reporter do? Where does that say they lie in bed with the police? You know, that's a crock of garbage. I mean, it's a, you know, you're looking under rocks, really. The, the, the press served the role of the police to try and lure this person I tell, I tell out you what, so as to be able to catch I tell you what, if him. And the after press that, the served press the role of the police, of if the, the press uh, yes. served the role of uh, whatever the police wanted, I'll say this. I am very proud, extremely proud, of anything I did in concert with the police. And that now, means if that you one suspended second, any if critical if judgment sec, of the police. Oh, absolutely rubbish. Who, who's suspending absolutely any critical judgment? Oh, indeed, where American Civil Liberties Union criticizing the police for what they did? No, it's up to you, bunch of bums. The guy would be still running around with a gun in his hand. We'll take a look at the performance of television news when Ion returns in a moment. The side of television is being criticized for exploiting violence. What are we on the news side doing when we allow Son of Sam to become so predominantly our own biggest story? One night recently in CBS Studio 46, uh, the, uh, a group of journalists talked I about the television the, side of the coverage. Our guests were Chris Borgen and Ellen Fleischer, Channel 2 News, Carl Tucker, start. President of the Saturday and Review, and Geraldo Rivera of ABC I, News. I you know, what worried me about uh, the television uh, that night, that afternoon and that night, was that I got a feeling that apart from, instead of being apart from the mob, they were inside the mob and raising their voices and uh, really almost inciting or adding to the flames, uh, which made New York 
and New Yorkers a very upset and panicky place. I, I certainly don't feel any personal responsibility for inciting anybody uh, to anything. Well, Geraldo, you've caught a lot of heat from some of your own colleagues as well for using words like fiend and murderer about David Berkowitz. Now, in retrospect, do those words still seem to you to be accurate and proper? Uh, yes. They do. I, I have exactly the quote. I was in Panama for three weeks after the controversy broke out, so I was the last person in New York to know that I was catching heat. As a matter of fact, my, I never got any heat from anybody except for the New York Post, which I thought was a real joke. Uh, here, here's my, I'll, I'll read, just for it to take me 15 seconds. Quote, my last commentary on the day he was caught. And so on the streets of the city today, there's anger and there's outrage at the murder suspect. There are bittersweet memories of his victims, but mostly there's a sense of relief. The man police say is the 44 caliber killer, the fiend who thought so much of his own hang-ups and so little of the value of human life, has finally been captured. Now, I don't think that that's incendiary at all. And the I call fiend. Yeah, I say the man police say is the 44 caliber killer, the fiend who... I think that the 44 caliber killer... That I say the man the mm -hmm. police say is the 44 caliber... The 44 caliber killer whether he's David Berkowitz, Mr. X, or Mr. Y, is a fiend. The man who, was the, who did those things was a fiend. Mm -hmm. Now, the definition of fiend, I'm sure, would, is definitely broad enough to encompass someone who murders seven, wounds six, and has a city in a reign of terror for a year. Grammatically, your, own, your case is very good. It doesn't know whether you're describing David Berkowitz or the 44 caliber killer. Chris, one of the things that, that uh, you were criticized for in a WCBS radio editorial was a piece in which apparently you demonstrated the 44 caliber killer's stance. Uh, this was at a time when that was an issue. That was supposed to be one of the clues that he assumed uh, the Kojak two-handed firing stance. The people at WCBS seemed to feel that this was a dangerous and irresponsible thing to do. And I guess in the sense that television can beget repetition and can beget imitation, it is sort of scary. Uh, as you think back on that, uh, is uh, WCBS <laughs> off base? Is this an easy shot, or is this something? I think you're asking me in effect if I had to do it today, would right. I do the same thing? And I think the answer to that is yes, uh, and for a very simple reason. I was doing a story in which I was trying to walk back through with a fantastic leader, which says this is a reenactment, as to what actually transpired in the three and a half minutes of the moment of the two people coming off of the bridge, going back to their car, and he. The son of Sam allegedly came out of the bushes. I was trying to illustrate what was seen or could have been seen by people in the area had they been looking. There had been a continuing request on the part of the police department for all information to be forthcoming. And I did walk across the street and with my hands, raised my hands in the manner I didn't have a gun or make believe that I had a gun. And I pointed at the car and said, he then fired four shots. If I was to be criticized, I think the criticism should have been that in fact, Three shots were fired. Carl, what sort of thoughts do you have coming from a, a print perspective as you've watched us electronic types mm -hmm. really kick this ball around? Well, I think uh, the answer is the uh, same one that you've arrived at, that it depends very heavily uh, on the personality, the honesty and decency of the individual reporter. I think that if there is a lesson to be learned, it is that it, the news networks, the, the news media, should make it their business to inculcate that kind of self-consciousness in a reporter so that he is able to step back and say, am I part of the mob or am I putting this thing in perspective? So that what you're saying then is that uh, what Geraldo says is emotional honesty mm -hmm. and sincerity and important to the truth of the story you are saying that the reporter really has a responsibility to edit all of that. No, he has the responsibility to, to do both. I know uh, Geraldo's a, a good case, so you have a very personal style of newscasting, but all that I ask, and I believe you, when you, when you get emotionally concerned about a story uh, because of your style, I don't know why, but, uh, but, I, but I believe you, uh, that there's reason to be that involved in it. The, the point is that uh, you have to keep balanced in your mind. Am I being a grandstander? Am I uh, trying to grab more time than this story really deserves? Or am I giving this story its fair shake? And that has to go in the, inside the mind of the individual news person. History is hindsight. Journalism is writing to deadline. Speaking the truth as best we know it at the time. Sometimes we're wrong. 
In the heat of a chase the size of Son of Sam, sometimes we write and talk as if we knew the final score. We don't. And when we forget that we don't, we can only rely on our viewers and our readers to remember for us and to forgive us our occasional errors. For Channel 2 News, this has been Eye on Son of Sam and the Media. I'm Dave Marish. Good night, and thanks for being with us. Thank you.